Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Ranger Nathan. I'm, of course, Ranger Nathan, and I'm a park ranger at Rosie the Riveter, World War II Homefront National Historical Park. Today we'll be reading Chapter 3 of V for Victory, a part of the Homefront Heroes book series by Teresa Funk, who has given us permission to read today. Uh, in the previous chapters, um, we have got Miguel and his friend Gary um, trying to win the Scrap Drive contest, and Alejandro has showed up um, in addition to Gary, which makes Miguel a little frustrated but not as frustrated as being stuck with his um, his little nephew uh, Victor who has to come along too. Chapter 3 The Crash. As we pass through the gate and the stone wall surrounding the convent we see we aren't the only ones visiting the sisters today. A guy about Juanita's age is coming down the stairs. He looks a little familiar but I can't be sure. He's wearing an army uniform and it takes me a minute to realize that his right short sleeve is pinned up to his shoulder. He must have lost his arm in the war. I find myself staring at his empty sleeve as we approach. When I glance up into his face, he's glaring at me, and I feel my cheeks go red. He's caught me looking at him. He continues to glower at me as he passes us by. Who's that? Gary asks. I don't know, but he looks familiar. I think he used to come into the store. I wonder what happened to his arm, Alejandro says. Why don't you go ask him? I snap, angry because it wasn't just me who noticed the soldier's arm, but it was only me the soldier glared at. Alejandro and I leave Gary and Victor with the wagon and climb the stairs of the big brick building. When we ring the bell, Sister Frances herself opens the huge door. We try not to fidget. Nuns hate that, but it's hard, especially when she looks down her nose at us. Miguel, Alejandro, what brings you here this afternoon? Her voice sounds a little lighter than it does in school. We're collecting scrap for the war effort, sister, I say. Would you have anything you could spare? You boys come in and I'll see if I can find anything for you. Alejandro starts to step through the door, but I reach out an arm to stop him. That's okay, sister. We'll wait here. The last thing we need is to sit in a convent with a bunch of nuns. Sister Frances looks amused. Suit yourself, she says. I'll be right back. When I turn around, Victor has crawled out of the wagon. He's pulling up flowers, and Victor is too busy watching us to notice. Victor, no, I cry, flying down the stairs to yank him away. So much for getting into Sister Frances's good graces. I try to pick Victor up, but he bats my hand away. He's pretty strong for a little guy. So we form a triangle around him to keep him from wandering. He screams and tries to dodge between us, but we make a game of trying to keep him in. We're not trying to be mean, but it's funny watching him get mad. And we're so caught up in the game that we don't notice that Sister Frances has returned. She's come down the stairs and is depositing some scrap in the wagon. There's a pot and a broken axe head and a couple of bent spoons and something that looks like a spittoon. But what would a spittoon be doing in a convent? I pick it up and consider it. Sister Frances crosses her arms and looks down at me. Sister Agatha used to spit tobacco juice. Nasty habit. I've been meaning to get rid of it since she passed away. She raises an eyebrow like she's daring me to say something. I set the spittoon down and pick up a roundish pan with a hole on top. Bedpan, she says. I've seen these in movies. They're for going to the bathroom in bed when you're too sick to get up. I drop it and wipe my fingers on my shirt. We take care of our sick here, of course, Sister Frances says, but I suppose we can spare one for the war effort. She arches that eyebrow again. Thanks, Sister, I say, busying myself with settling Victor amongst the junk in the wagon so I don't have to look her in the eyes. If you win that $20, I hope you'll keep the church in mind, she says, turning back toward the gate. How'd she know we were trying to win the contest? Gary whispers to me. How do nuns know anything? They just do. A huge plane flies low over the convent. Victor reaches up for it. Goonie bird, Gary and I say, which is the nickname for the C-47. Then we all hightail it down the hill, wanting to put some distance between us and the convent. Victor laughs as he and the first pieces of our scrap heap jostle around in the wagon. We hit a few of the houses in the neighborhood, and people who've already dug deep for scrap look again. They come out with only little stuff, a broken alarm clock, a rusty pipe, a large ball of tin foil. We're not accomplishing much, and Victor is getting cranky. It's time for his nap, so we decide to take him back. As we're rounding the corner to our store, we're scheming how to get old Mr. Garza to let us take apart that car he never drives anymore. Think of all the scrap that could bring in. But then we hear a tremendous crash. The windows on the houses rattle. We stop where we are. Everyone on the street has stopped too. There's a feeling that's spreading. Something bad has happened. Victor can sense it too. He starts to whimper. I go back to pick him up, and this time he doesn't protest. Then we see it, thick black smoke billowing towards the sky. Someone screams, and then everyone starts running toward the smoke. 
We see my mother and sister come out of the store. Juanita doesn't even notice us as she rushes off in the direction everyone else is heading. But Mama stops a man rushing back the other way. What is it? She asks. Plane crash, the man says, a couple of blocks away. Looks like the pilot lost control and crashed into a house. I'm going to call an ambulance. Gary and Alejandro exchange a look and take off down the street. I try to hand Victor to Mama so I can follow, but she pushes him back at me. No, mijo, you stay here. Keep an eye on Victor and the storm. But Mama, do as I say, Mama says. Nuts. I stomp into the store and dump Victor on the counter by the cash register and go back outside. I stand on my tiptoes as if I could actually see something. I barely notice the man who slips by me into the store. I hear a thud and the sounds of something rattling across the floor, and Victor says, uh-oh. He's knocking a five-pound bag of pinto beans off the counter. Mama must have been filling the bags when she heard the crash. There are beans everywhere. Oh, Victor, I cry. Look what you did. I drop down to my knees to scoop up the beans. Look what you did, a voice says, left a baby on top of a counter. Not too swift, brother. I glance up and see the soldier from the convent, the one with the missing arm. He's pushing beans towards me with his boot, and I don't appreciate the smirk on his face. Well, I shouldn't be here, I say. I always get stuck with him. I want to see what's going on. What's to see? A plane crashed. Very likely a man or two died. Lots of men die in this war. I think of Ernesto when he says that, and my stomach flips. I sit back on my heels and gaze up at the one-armed man. You know we're not open. It's Sunday. We close at noon on Sunday. That's okay. I'm just looking. Do I know you? I ask. Not really. I knew your sister, though. Juanita. We were in high school together our senior year. What's your name? Alfonso. Alfonso Riviera. I point at the chevron on his uniform sleeve. Private Rivera. His, fa his face clouds over. Not anymore. You should quit feeling sorry for yourself and take that kid off the counter before he falls. You should mind your own beeswax, I say. He glowers at, at me and turns away. Just then, Gary skids to stop outside the front door and waves me over. Look what I got, he says. It's a piece of metal about the size of his fist. It's from the plane. He hands it to me and I turn it over in my hand. It's warm to the touch. You, you gonna put it on the scrap heap? No, sir, I'm keeping this one. You should have seen it, Miguel. There were parts of the plane everywhere. What kind of plane was it? AT-18, I think. One of those advanced trainer planes. Even though I don't know much about those planes, Gary does. Gary knows about every plane. They're supposed to be hard to land, he says, lightweight and flimsy. Folks say the plane stalled and hit some power lines, then it slammed right into the roof of a house. The lady in the house got out, though. She was standing right beside me, watching her house burn. Gary shakes his head, and he doesn't look as excited anymore. The soldier is over by the vegetable bins. I can feel him staring at me, and I know what he's waiting for me to ask. What about the crew, I ask. Don't know. Dead, I guess. Your mother wouldn't let me get close enough to see. The smoke was thick anyway. The soldier comes up to the counter. His eyes are boring into me. He places a tube of Colgate dental cream on the counter. I can't help you, I say. I'm not allowed to run the register yet. Then I'll wait, he says, but I wish he wouldn't. I don't like the way he's looking at me, like he can see right through me. Where is Alejandro? His mother saw him at the crash site, said he should go home. You should go too then, I say to Gary, handing him back the piece of plane. Don't forget the wagon. Don't you want to go around some more? No, nah, I don't feel like it. Besides, I got work to do. Gary shrugs his shoulders. See you tomorrow then. As he's leaving, I hear Juanita's voice and snatch Victor off the counter as Mama and Juanita come in. I don't ask them I don't ask them what they saw. They drift right past me and didn't don't even notice the soldier. Mama goes to the step stool we keep behind the counter and sits down, her head in her hands. Juanita stands beside her, her eyes fixed on the floor. I cross my arms and glare at the soldier as if to say, I told you so. No one's going to help you. I'll be back later, he says, leaving the dental cream on the counter. I hope he doesn't come back. The guy gives me the willies. That is the end of chapter three. Thank you so much for joining and we'll have another story time soon.